Hi everybody, doc, this is Dr. Anna, and I'm here to talk to you about the rocks, the most important rocks in the Earth's crust, and this is what we have to learn here. Starting with the igneous, followed by the sedimentary, and uh, last, uh, the metamorphic rocks I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to start with the igneous ones, and uh, inside the igneous rocks I will go by the SiO2 content, silica oxide content, and... Um, as you know, we divide it into felsic, intermediate, mafic, and ultramafic groups. Uh, I'm going to start with the felsic rocks. Um, remember, the felsic rocks has more than 65% SiO2. Uh, the first rock here, which you will have to know, is the granite. The granite is an intrusive igneous rock. That means that it forms deep down in the earth crust. And uh, because of the temperature is high down there, it will take a long time for the for the uh, magma to crystallize, that for every single minerals you will be able to see with your naked eye. Right there, that's a K feldspar, sodium plagioclase, typical quartz, another quartz. Uh, if I turn it around, you can see that the feldspars have good cleavages, uh, some biotite, the black ones, and amphiboles. So, phenolytic texture, that means you can see all the uh, minerals with your naked eyes, so you can tell quartz, uh, sodium plagioclase, K feldspar, amphibole, and some biotites. So granite. The second one is the rhyolite. Rhyolite has a affinitic texture. It's uh, co by composition the same as granite, and the only difference. See, the granite, you can see all the minerals, but in rhyolite, you don't. And the reason for that is because the magma came up to the surface and cooled down really quickly, so there was no time for minerals to form. Uh, you know that it's a phasic rock because usually it's a very light color, but you won't see any minerals in it with your naked eye, except sometimes a couple of low specks of biotite or some teeny tiny quartz or, or feldspar crystals. Uh, the color of the rock usually is either light pink or light gray, definitely very light colored, and the density is very light also. When you uh, held it in your hand, along with like, let's say a basalt I'm gonna go through in a minute, this is much, much lighter than this one. So this is rhyolite. Composition, same as granite, different way of cooling down. Third one is the volcanic glass or obsidian. The composition is very much like the granite, but as you can see, the most important difference between the two is the way they cool down. So this took a long time, probably a million years, this cooled down instantly, so it become completely a volcanic glass. But if you look at the composition, it is very much uh, similar to the composition of the granite. It's just the way it cooled down, which is different. Obsidian is a volcanic glass. It has this beautiful conchoidal structure, uh, conchoidal fracture, that's just the way it breaks. You can have obsidian, which are black, but also you sometimes can find red obsidian. So see, they are exactly the same. They just have different color. Uh, if there was some trace elements in it, which can change the color possibly, that's what happened, or a different location. Uh, the next one is the fuzzy group still. It's the pumice. What is characteristic about the pumice is that it's very, very light. Actually, if you put it in water, it will float. It's so light. The most important part of the pumice is the, the gas. It has a so-called vesicular texture because it's full of gas bubbles, and in between the bubbles, actually, there are volcanic glass uh, structures. They are like hair, very, very thin volcanic glass. Basically, the pumice is the same as the fiberglass, but we could say that the fiberglass is an artificial pumice. The pumice is one of the best insulator, so when they come up with the fiberglass, they basically try to, try to imitate the, the pumice structure. So remember, it's really, really light. Uh, the texture is vesicular, and it's mostly volcanic glass. Uh, I'm going to show you a pyroclast. Pyroclast is when you have uh, rock fragments, mineral fragments, 
uh, cemented together by volcanic ash. This one here is a light colored one, so it's a rhyolite tuff, we call it. That's the name of the rock, rhyolite tuff. Uh, we have rock fragments in it, and remember, it's cemented with volcanic ash. I just finished the phasic rocks. Remember, the phasic rocks have more than 65% SiO2 in them, so therefore they light, and usually they have lower density than the mafic rocks. Now we're going to continue with the intermediate rocks. This is the phaneritic version. It's called diorite. It's phaneritic because you can see every single mineral in it. So it formed deep down in the earth crust. And we know that it's black and white. So actually the nickname for this rock is salt and pepper rock. The white ones are uh, feldspars. They are albite, sodium plagioclase. And the black ones are amphiboles. So diorite, that's the intrusive version of the intermediate group. The intermediate group, by the way, have 45 to 60% SiO2 content. Uh, so it's somewhat um, heavier than the phasic rocks and lighter than the mafic ones. So intermediate diorite. The extrusive version of the diorite is the underside. And as you can see, the andesite has a typical so-called porphyritic texture. When you do see some minerals, those are the phenocrysts. They are usually amphiboles. And then uh, you have the matrix where you don't see anything with your naked eye. You have to use microscope for that. So here is the phenocryst or porphyritic minerals. These are amphiboles in this case. So this andesite is actually an amphibole andesite. Porphyritic texture, big minerals, matrix where you cannot see anything without the microscope. The composition is the same as the diorite, and it's easy to tell them apart because the diorite is the salt and pepper rock, and the andesite is a porphyritic texture with some big minerals and then the matrix. The big minerals are phenocrysts. So this is the intermediate igneous group. And now we are at the mafic igneous rocks. The mafic igneous rocks um, have 35 to 45% SiO2. They mostly contain of calcium plagioclase or uh, anortite and pyroxene. Um, their SiO2 content is between 35 and 45 again, and the, the, the intrusive version here is the gabbro. As you can see that in the gabbro, because of the phanoritic texture, you can touch every mineral, so you know it's calcium plagioclase with good cleavages, pyroxene crystals with good cleavages. So this is the gabbro. The next one is the extrusive version of it is the, the basalt. And as you can see, the basalt is black, relatively heavy, and it has a aphanitic texture, means you don't see any big minerals with your naked eye. So it's all black. So this is an aphanitic texture, it's extrusive. Composition is same as the gabbro. You cannot mix the two because in the gabbro you can see all the minerals and here you just see the aphanitic texture. You don't see any kind of minerals. You need to use a microscope. But both of them are dark, so it's easy to remember. This one is the porphyritic basalt. The porphyritic basalt is different from the basalt because basalt doesn't have any phenocryst. The porphyritic basalt has some big pyroxene, usually pyroxene phenocrysts right there. The andesite has these elongated uh, amphiboles where the porphyritic basalt has this bigger, more square-shaped pyroxene crystal. So you cannot really mix the two either. The next one is the scoria. The scoria is the gas-rich uh, mafic version. It's similar to the felsic pumice. However, the, the scoria is always dark colored and it will not float on the water. So it's easy to separate it from the pumice. Pumice is very, very light, floats on the water. Scoria has the gas bubbles, so it has vesicular structure, stuck, structure, sorry. However, it will not float on the water. It's it went in right away. 
So that's chorea. The last group is the ultramafic igneous uh, rock group. The ultramafic has less than 35% of SiO2. Uh, the only rock you will have to know here is the dunite. The dunite has olivine and low pyroxene specs. The low black specs are pyroxenes. If the amount of pyroxene is more than 10%, then it's a different rock. We call it peridotite. So you might see in uh, rocks named peridotite. Don't get scared. This is the same thing as dunite, except it has more than 10% pyroxene in it. This guy have one or two percent pyroxene, so that's why we call this dunite. So these are the igneous rocks you'll have to know. Okay, now we're going to talk about uh, the sedimentary rocks. The first, uh, we're going to start with the clastic sedimentary rocks. Um, which are formed by physical weathering. Therefore, you will have rock fragments in these rocks, and you will be able to tell what the parent rock used to be. I'm going to start with the conglomerate. The conglomerate is a typical gravel-sized sediment containing sedimentary rocks, where the gravel-sized sediments are rounded. So conglomerate, rounded grays, grains, and they are gravel sized. This here is the uh, cement material and the matrix. Uh, they are much finer grain, so therefore this is very badly sorted. And you might have different kind of rock fragments in it. So this is conglomerate. The next one is the breccia which also has gravel site sediment in them, and they are angular, angular. That means that they haven't been really traveled. The only uh, thing which probably transported them could have been glaciers, so they didn't get rounded at all. So this is brachia or bracha, as I call it. There is another bracha right here. You see how the, the grains are very, very angular. So it's easy to... Uh, separate them from conglomerate because conglomerate has rounded pebbles and these are very angular right here. Next one is the quartz sandstone. Now we are at the sand size. Remember, anything which is larger than 2 millimeter is gravel. The sand is between 2 millimeter and 0 0.063 millimeter. Remember, that is the size of the lines on your fingernail. So when you touch the sandstone, you can fill the grains. When you touch the next size, the silt, then you can feel that it goes in between the lines on your finger. So this is quartz sandstone. Quartz sandstone has quartz only in it, so it is very um, mature because everything else have weathered away. All we have left is quartz. Very well sorted, very well uh, rounded grains if we looked at it under the microscope. So this is quartz sandstone. This one is the arcose, the second type of sandstone. This is less mature because it has a bunch of K feldspar. You, you see those pink feldspar particles? And the, the uh, rack is not as well sorted. It's like uh, medium sorted. The grains are uh, somewhat angular. So that just means that this rock formed closer to the mountain, which is the source area for the sedimentary rocks, by weathering, and it didn't get transported very far. So this is what we call arcos. This here is the gray wacky. This is gray uh, sandstone. It's relatively fine grain, though, but you can still feel the grains. It has rock fragments in it, and it has quartz. Uh, it's usually gray, and it didn't get transported too far away, so usually it's, it's relatively immature. Next one is the siltstone. Remember with the sedimentary uh, rocks, the color doesn't really matter. It only talks to you about, tells you about the oxygen level of the environment. If you had a lot of oxygen, that means everything... All the organic material decays, and most of the time the iron picks up oxygen, so it makes light brown, light red colors. So when the 
the rock has light brownish, reddish, or yellowish rock, that means that they form near the surface, but there was a lot of oxygen present. So this one here is the siltstone. When you have a siltstone, when you touch it, you know that the grains are smaller than the lines on your finger, so they will actually go in between the lines. So you can see that the, the rock, uh, you had a lot of grains going in between your uh, lines on your finger. So this is siltstone. It's mostly contains clay and quartz. Siltstone. The mudstone is the next. Again, remember the color can be any. It just depends how much oxygen is in the environment. So this one is pretty black. So for this, you could have two ways uh, for formation. It could be either in coastal swamp, where uh, as the sediment, it's, it's stagnant water, so the sediment which settles down usually a very fine-grained. And it's so fine-grained that it doesn't let the oxygen go through. So very many times in the coastal swamps, the sediment become black. And if there is any organic material, it cannot decay, so therefore these are the places where coal would form. Uh, but it could have different colors depending on how much oxygen, as I said. So this is a mudstone. Remember, you don't worry about the color that much. You're going to try to find out the grain size. And to see if it's uh, carbonate or plastic, you use the hydrochloric acid. If it fizzes, then it's carbonate. If it doesn't fizz like this one, then you know it's mudstone. It's greasy feeling when you touch it. So it's easy to tell that it's mudstone because it doesn't fizz with the hydrochloric acid and it feels greasy. So you know it's very, very fine grained. So this is mudstone. When uh, the mudstone is fissile, it splits into small layers, it will make the so-called shale. So everything between the mudstone and the shale is the same, except that the shale has this low, uh, teeny tiny layers because of the facility. And these are the classic sedimentary rocks you'll have to know. And now we're going to go into the chemical, biochemical sedimentary rocks. The first uh, are the carbonates. The carbonates are forming in the tropics, so it's equator, 30 degree north, 30 degree south. Uh, and these carbonates, we have two kinds. One is the limestone, the other one is the dolomite. The limestone usually are calcium carbonate, like almost 100%. Therefore, any limestone, when you put hydrochloric acid on it, will vigorously fizz. Because hydro hydrochloric acid plus calcium carbonate will react uh, producing calcium chloride plus CO2. And the bubbles you see are CO2 bubbles, carbon dioxide bubbles. So the first type of limestone you will have to know is the oolitic limestone. And the oolitic limestone has this low sand-sized particles. We call them oolites. The oolites form uh, on the beaches usually when the climate is arid and the waves are moving back and forth and the calcium carbonate precipitates on low grains in the ocean because the water becomes super saturated in calcium carbonate, that's why. So we end up having a rock which is very similar to sandstone. When you touch it, it feels like sandstone. However, when you put the hydrochloric acid on it, it's gonna fizz because it's actually a limestone. Remember, this is the oolitic limestone. Next one is the coquina. Coquina is probably the easiest rock. It's nothing but shell fragments, so it represents very high energy environment, which means close to the, the beach where the waves are very vigorous. And it just broken shell fragments. Again, because it's a limestone, when we put hydrochloric acid on it, it's vigorously will uh, fizz. So this is one of the easiest one, coquina. Next one is the fossiliferous limestone. Fossiliferous limestone forms usually in deeper water because it's limestone, easy to remember, it's fizzing. And uh, it has fossils in it, so it's definitely biochemical, just like the coquina was. The oolitic limestone we just talked about is chemical because it, it forms by the ocean uh, precipitating from the ocean when it's supersaturated, mainly during 
arid times. Uh, so the fossil leaf ferrous limestone, remember, because it's deeper water, it can have any color because if it's in an environment when there is no oxygen, it's going to be black, like the very famous hockey stone in Blacksburg. The last type of limestone you'll have to know is the lime mudstone, which actually is very, very similar to the mudstone. Now, not in color, but for touch. But remember, it's easy to separate because the mudstone will not fizz, where the lime mudstone will vigorously fizzing. So you shouldn't mix those two ever. The next rock you will have to know is the dolomite. Dolomite, in a lot of ways, looks very, very similar to the limestone. However, it will not fizz. When you put acid on it, you don't see any uh, effervescence. However, if you scratch it with a uh, nail and then you put the uh, acid on it, you can see that it actually effervesces. So, Dolomite, you scratch it first, then it effervesce, otherwise it doesn't, uh, it doesn't effervesce at all. So you have to scratch it to see the, the bubbles fizzing and uh, occurring. So you scratch it, put the acid on it, and you see that it fizzes. Dolomite. Now we are at the evaporates. It starts with the gypsum. It is the gypsum. I usually have two kinds, the fibrous one and the gypsum crystal. It's easy to know because they both will be scratched by fingernail and uh, they don't look like anything else. It's the gypsum. Then you have the rock salt. Rock salt is easy to know because it's salty, but even if you don't taste it, if you hold it with your hands and rub it a little bit, it starts, the moisture in your hands starts to dissolve it, so you can feel it slimy when you touch it. So this is the rock salt or the halite. The next one is the chert, and the chert, remember, is a bit similar to the obsidian, but... Um, it doesn't really have the, it does have conchoidal fracture a little bit, but it's not a volcanic rock. It's not as, not a volcanic glass. It's not shiny or anything like that. It's uh, the chert, but it will scratch the glass. So it's kind of easy to remember. It has a greasy feeling too. And the last two rock is the coal. We have two kinds of coal. One is the bituminous coal. It's black, very light, so you cannot mix it with anything else. It's light and black. It's not shiny, but the anthracite is very shiny. So you can tell the two apart by the shininess. The anthracite is shiny, but the bituminous coal is not. So these are the sedimentary rocks. Uh, the last group you will uh, we'll have to work with is the metamorphic rocks. Uh, as you remember, they form by heat and pressure. Uh, and I'm going to make it really easy. You will just have to know low, medium, high grade metamorphic rocks. And uh, also the crystalline ones, which are the marble and the quartzite. So let's start with the low-grade metamorphic rocks. The slate is the first one you'll have to know. The slate is basically uh, typically foliated like every a lot of the metamorphic rocks, and it consists of clay minerals. Basically, the difference between uh, slate and the uh, mudstone and the shale we learned in the sedimentary rocks that the, the slate got a little bit uh, heated up, so they it become more... The way I can tell them apart is that when I hit the slate, it has this high pitch where the, the shell doesn't. So that's a way to tell them apart. This is fissile shell, and this is foliated slate. 
The color, again, doesn't matter because it depends on what kind of uh, sedimentary rock it formed for, what kind of color the original rock had. That is the color. The next one is the phyllite. The phyllite is very similar to the to the slate, but it's easy to tell them apart because the phyllite has this shiny, silvery color on it, and that is from micro crystalline uh, microcrystalline muscovite, which is the sericite. So here is the slate, and that's the phyllite. It's easy to tell them apart. They both are foliated, and remember the slate is just baked um, shale, so it's clay. This one is the phyllite. It has clay minerals plus the sericite, which makes it silvery, so it's easy to tell the two apart. The medium, the medium grade uh, metamorphic rock is the mica schist. The mica schist usually breaks along the biotite and muscovite. It has biotite, muscovite, it has quartz and feldspar, and very characteristically, it has a lot of uh, porphyroblasts. Those are the big crystals which go bigger. There is a starolite crystal, which they also call fairy stone, and then there are some garnets, which is very characteristic in the mica schist. It's also very foliated rock, so foliation is characteristic. The mica is on the bottom and the top, and the porphyroblast, which are garnet and starolite. The next one is the gneiss. The gneiss is the high-grade metamorphic rock, you have to know. Uh, it's very characteristic that it has these mineral bands. The whites are usually feldspars and the blacks are amphibole biotites. And a lot of the times they have porphyroblasts, mostly garnet or staurolite still. So this is nice. Depending on what color the feldspar, you have different nices. And by the way, the nice is a very good building rack, and it's also very aesthetic, so you can use it for buildings also. It could be pink, the feldspar is pink, it's really, really pretty, or this white feldspar. So that's nice. Uh, the next one you'll have to know is the quartzite. The quartzite is a uh, non-foliated sediment, uh, metamorphic rocks. Just means it's it's sucroic texture. It's quartz crystals, and it forms from quartz sandstone. So at any grade, it forms the same quartzite. So it basically is recrystallite quartz, which form from the quartz sandstone. Remember, the color can be any. This will scratch the glass. It's really hard. So it really is very easy to tell it apart from the marble because the marble, even though it looks very similar, as you can see them together, they both have sucroic texture. It forms at any grade. However, it's easy to tell it apart independently from the color because the marble, when you put um, hydrochloric acid, it fizzes, but the quartzite doesn't. So it's easy to tell it apart. Marble is fizzing and the quartzite is not. <coughs> so don't go by the pink and white color because marble can be any color. Dep depending on what the limestone originally looked like, the marble could be black, red, pink, whatever. The quartzite too, depending on what color the original sandstone was. So the quartzite, marble will fizz, quartzite will not. So right there. Okay, I'll see you.